This video presentation is about shoulder pain, how to make the diagnosis. I am Mary Lloyd Ireland with the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine at the University of Kentucky, and it is with pleasure that I show you these slides, many of which are cases that I've taken care of over the years in my orthopedic practice. There are many clinical tests named after someone. Instead of describing that name, I think it's a good idea to think of the motion of the joint, the forces you apply, and you can use this as a descriptor in your dictation or your template. So think of the motion of the joint and the forces that you apply. If it's a labral problem, we want to apply axial load like a McMurray's of the knee for a meniscus tear. So if it is a rotator cuff problem, you have to think of it as a compression or impinging problem. So anything that you do to lessen the subacromial space will cause problem. Or is it an instability problem, distraction of the capsule, subluxing the humeral head? Do the most painful part of the test last? I do start off looking at the scapula, do a seated exam, have the patient actively move their shoulder around, and that'll give you an idea of what you'll be able to do with their exam. If they're forward flexed in a kyphotic position, oftentimes everything hurts, including touching their neck, their scapula, or their shoulder. Others have a rotator cuff tear and may have full motion, but you really hurt them if you do manual muscle testing in empty can position and tell them to resist because they usually will and they'll have a significant amount of pain. After examining the scapula, then do a seated exam. I think this is an excellent way to do exam for stability and also passive motion. You can tell whether there's a defect in the rotator cuff at its insertion, pain over the biceps and the bicipital groove, rotating the shoulder with the arm at the side and then bringing it up to 90 degrees. You can't do all of the tests. Pick the best few tests in your hands and do them on the patient's. After my seated exam, I'll do a supine exam, and then on occasion we'll do a prone exam to palpate the scapula, stabilize the scapula, and posteriorly luxate the humeral head, putting the arm toward the table and pushing back on the humeral head. You can stabilize the scapula and then go into an external rotated backward flex position, and if they have anterior instability, they won't like that. There are a lot of named tests. Sometimes the people for whom the test is named don't know what that test is. A prime example of a lot of named tests are for biceps tendon disorders. If we have this many named tests for it, it's better to stick with just a few and talk about what movement you are doing to reproduce pain. Oftentimes if you listen to patients they'll tell you what movements bother you and you can make a diagnosis before laying your hands on them. So for biceps tendon proximal labral problem we know from arthroscopies that if we externally rotate the arm this is a peel back and the labrum if it's torn peels back oftentimes with pain clinically into the biceps just like in a McMurray's maneuver, actually loading and rotation will create pain, but do the most painful part of the exam last, and you can kind of bet on which part this is going to be based on their age and their sport. So these names for proximal tendon dysfunction of the long head, these are only six to start off with. We can include these for a complete exam, but rarely is a biceps tendon problem isolated. Prior to arthroscopy and our better understanding of partial tears, slap tears, rotator cuff tear, problems with a capsule and instability, by looking with a scope and understanding the biomechanics in the lab, we made the diagnosis of an isolated biceps tendon problem all the time. We're now better at diagnosing based on our physical exam and our MR imaging. We also have to think about the subscapularis and a partial tear of the subscap, particularly in association with medial instability of the biceps as we see on MRI scans, which we would see on MRI scans. So I'll talk about all these tests. We can also describe what we're doing when we're doing these tests, but basically we're rotating 
and wrapping up the biceps, creating pain in the bicepital groove. The position of the Abbott and Saunders test, little axial load going into extra rotation and then internal rotation. You're palpating the biceps and this creates pain. The Anquins, more of a supination, not quite as abducted as the pre previous test, and Matson's test with pain directly over the bicepital groove and the biceps proximally. The seeds test, as shown here, the palm is up, forearm supinated. You ask the patient to flex their shoulder against the resistance of your hand with the elbow extended, and this creates pain in the proximal biceps in the groove that you're palpating. So if this is, creates pain, then it's a positive test. Again, if you think about your wrapping up the biceps either in the extremes of internal or external rotation. This is a modified peel back that we have developed and we understand from arthroscopic pictures. Yersens, another named test. This is with the arm flexed. The patient is asked to forcefully supinate against resistance. Pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder and the bicepal groove is a positive result. So again, you're doing it more in a flex position against forced supination, which the biceps does, the pain in the proximal um, biceps area. Ludington's test. Hands are behind the head. Patient is asked to flex the biceps. The examiner's finger is in the bicepal groove pain occurs when you're palpating the biceps in the groove and you ask them to do as in a sit-up maneuver. There can be differences in concept of the biceps tendon uh, looking at this with this maneuver. If there is an asymmetry you must think about a biceps uh, rupture, that Popeye deformity that we would see in a complete biceps tendon rupture. Oftentimes it's spontaneous. The biceps is a pain generator. The biceps tendon attaches to the labrum. This is the biceps glenoid labrum anchor. And oftentimes with a tear of the labrum superiorly, the pain is generated down into the biceps. The labrum functions as a stabilizer, a bumper for the attachment of the biceps, and a shock absorber. So oftentimes in making a diagnosis, if you look at the proximity of the biceps and the glenoid and its anatomy, a slap tear involves the biceps. Therefore, there will be pain that is generated down into the bicipital groove and the entire anterior aspect of the shoulder. If the labrum is torn, as in a slap lesion, these tears can propagate into the biceps itself, and the shoulder in 50% of the time will be unstable because of this detachment of the labrum superiorly. The classic Bankart lesion is the anterior inferior glenoid labrum that is torn, oftentimes a little piece of bone of the glenoid, which can still be attached with a capsule anterior inferiorly. Sometimes it can become a loose body. So the inferior glenohumeral ligament, or the ACL of the shoulder, then becomes unstable because it's no longer connected to the labrum, which is connected to the glenoid. Another analogy that we can think about is the humeral head being like a big golf ball in a shallow tee. That Bankart lesion anteriorly, if you knock off or fracture that glenoid, you don't have the normal concavity of the glenoid. and It's almost like breaking off the, first, the front part of a tee. If you try to use that tee to stabilize your ball, the ball fall off. So, hence the instability that occurs. And when we do stabilization surgery, we recreate that bumper effect 
by putting the labrum and the capsule back up to the T, creating that normal concavity and stability for the golf ball. Another analogy that I think is very important is the circus seal under the ball. Think of the circus seal as being the scapula, and his little nose is the glenoid. So if the scapula is sick and not in the right position, the glenoid is also not going to be in the right position under the humeral head. So it can be a problem of instability where the humeral head's coming anterior, but also the glenoid isn't functioning normally or isn't in the right position, and then there can be a multi-directional instability of the, uh, of the shoulder. And addressing the labrum is important, but if it is more of a multi-directional voluntary instability, if we can get the scapula well, then the shoulder will not require surgical intervention, particularly if it's more of a capsular uh, looseness that is natural. Another analogy that I think is uh, good for a slap tear is the contact lens on the eyeball. So if there is a little rent or tear in the contact lens, then it's not going to have that normal communication with the eyeball, and there will be pain, bubbles, things won't work very well. So what we try to establish when we do arthroscopic surgery of labral reattachments, as in a slap repair in the normal tissue to put it back onto the glenoid and reestablishing that very fine uh, balanced relationship of the contact lens on the eyeball or the labral communication to the um, eyeball itself. Contact lens to eyeball, labrum to the glenoid, to the uh, humeral head. When we look at uh, tests about the labrum, this study from 2003 in the Arthroscopy Journal is a prospective study, 61 shoulders and 62 patients. These are the tests that were used for labral tears. We've talked about a lot of uh, a lot of these tests, specifically for the biceps. Again, the biceps uh, is the uh, attachment to the biceps glenoid labrum anchor. And if you have a problem with the biceps, oftentimes it starts with a slap tear or a tear in the um, labrum itself that propagates into or transfers pain down into the biceps tendon, which is a pain generator. So in this study, only the O'Brien and Job relocation test were statistically correlated with a labrum tear, including a slap tear. The other five tests were found not useful for labral tears, and none of the tests or combinations statistically valid for a slap lesion only, meaning that a lot of these, uh, particularly baseball athletes, have combined problems of a slap tear, perhaps instability, micro-instability, anterior instability, as well as rotator cuff problems. So this is the O'Brien's test. The right position that creates pain is shown on the right side in the thumb down or empty can position. The examiner asks the patient to push up against them with the arms, hands touching. On the left shows the position where pain is relieved. This is a positive test if they have pain in the empty can position and then it improves in the uh, palm up position. You can also have pain in the AC joint but if it's pain that is deep, this is more of a slap, consistent with a slap tear. And this is Dr. O'Brien's description from New York of the test. And I find this a very useful test, as supported by the uh, previous study. So this is a video of this test. 
Uh, he is in the empty can position. I'm asking him to resist me. If they hurt in their proximal biceps and then it improves in the palm up position, that indicates a slap tear irritation of the biceps. If the pain is more superficial, that would indicate a primary acromioclavicular problem. This is the peel back sign. This is a arthroscopy of a right shoulder in the lateral decubitus position. The humeral head is on the top. The structure that's the white structure in the front is the biceps tendon. There's a subscap down below. And this person has a Buford complex in a uh, in a normal variant attachment in the front, but you can see the labrum in the back peels back and there's a space between the glenoid and the labrum. So this is the uh, normal anatomic variant of the middle glenohumeral ligament and essentially absent anterior superior labrum, but where the labrum starts just um, toward us from the green cannula is where the slap originates. So we externally rotate and you can see where that peels back and then we internally rotate. So that's the position of the O'Brien's test in an internal rotated position and then it peels back. So clinically what we see is we see instability and pain in both extremes. So here we are in external rotation and then we go to internal rotation. So clinically there's pain in extremes. You can see the subscap down there uh, in the upper left hand corner normal subscap, normal variant of a Buford complex anterior superior, and a peel back sign associated with a slap tear. So we've learned a lot from looking at arthroscopies, learning what we see in certain sports and correlating that back to mechanism of injury and biomechanics in the lab to understand what's going on and more importantly what needs to be fixed and not fixed. So the Buford lesion is an anatomic variant. We don't do anything with that. We fix his labrum restore normal exam including the scapular position, uh, the best mechanics possible in his sport and return him to um, play. May take up to a year after a slap repair to do that. So external rotation, internal rotation and think about this as it correlates with what you're doing on your physical exam. So the O'Brien's test causes pain. External rotation also causes pain, as in when they're throwing overhead and maximal cocking. So this is a uh, MRI scan of a left shoulder, someone who has uh, a detached labrum. You can see the gap from the glenoid. This is best seen in the lower left, where the labrum is the triangular structure that is well away from the proximal um, humerus a slap lesion in someone who also had instability, normal rotator cuff. Labrum should be attached where the arrow is and it's well displaced. This patient had improvement with arthroscopic stabilization but continued to have pain into the biceps. As we've repaired more labral tears, we are looking back at who needs a labral repair, what are the ages of successful repair, and now probably patients in their 40s would better benefit from debridement of the labrum and doing a biceps tendon cutting, a tenotomy where you let it fly, or a tenodesis where you park it to other tissue subcutaneous um, into the area of the rotator cuff or sometime into bone subpectoral into the proximal humerus. The biceps is a pain generator. Sometimes the way to get rid of the pain is to cut the biceps, which you really have to explain to patients why you're doing that. There can be some subsequent weakness of the uh, biceps of elbow flexion and asymmetry if the tenodesis becomes a anatomy, but in general the patient's pain is improved. There could be some minor cosmetic differences one side compared to the other. This is a slap tear in a young pitcher. You can see in the upper left hand slide we're lifting the labrum. The biceps is the white structure up on the left. 
This is definitely a peel back, so the labrum is peeled back from the glenoid. To be able to successfully repair this, one must prepare the glenoid, get it down to a bleeding base, and then the blue suture in the middle upper picture shows the labrum is repaired. And you think about that, a couple of sutures are holding that labrum where it should be. It takes a long time, months before that's secure enough with the healing back to the glenoid to be able to withstand the significant torque of external rotation and throwing a ball. This young pitcher had primarily a slap tear, kept on throwing, and he ended up with a rotator cuff tear. We're seeing this more and more. He had a partial articular sided tear, which is called a posta lesion. So you can see here where we've got a blue uh, PDS suture coming in, in the upper right to identify where this tear is, and it was almost all the way through, so we elected to repair this didn't take it down. There's some controversy about what to take down. He had pretty good tissue, so we did this repair, putting the anchors in. The lower left is where you can see the sutures coming through. We had two anchors. In the middle picture on the lower um, section is the subacromial space where you can see these, um, these are tied down in the subacromial space. And then the lower right is an example of uh, what the rotator cuff now looks like under the correct tension. So this was a insufficiently functioning rotator cuff that we had to put down to the greater tuberosity. And we did this uh, without taking down the footprint of the rotator cuff, but we did prepare the, the bed at the greater tuberosity. So this is a great example of a slap tear and a young pitcher who kept on pitching ends up with a rotator cuff tear and a repair. He was out for six months, uh, no throwing for six months, did a little tossing, returned to baseball, not pitching at a year. So he was unable to return to his former position as a pitcher at the age of 15. Retired from pitching because of an injury of a slap tear and a rotator cuff tear. We're seeing more and more young pitchers with rotator cuff tears. This should be stopped, and our campaign, the Stop Injuries campaign, should be instituted in baseball. Spread the word.